Hola amigos. In case you're new here, my name is Daniel Suelo. I am known as the man who quit money. I lived without money for 15 years from 2000 through 2015. Then I had to start taking care of my parents and now just my mother. So I don't exactly live without money now. I live, I still live minimally and use money sparingly, but I have to manage my mother's finances and do grocery shopping and pay bills, etc., etc. Anyway, if you want to know more about my life without money, you can check out my website. It has frequently asked questions, and the link is below. Today, I want to talk about money and usury. This is in response to a comment somebody made a few weeks ago. They said that usury is the problem, money is not the problem. And I've talked extensively about usury, and I've talked about the evils of usury. And there's a link also below about that, about what the world's religions and philosophers say about usury. This video, I want to talk about how usury and money are inextricably linked from the very beginning, from the very conception of money in the beginning. And how we can tell the history of money and the evolution of money is just by our language, by the etymology of our words. For example, the word pecuniary and the word for fee and feudal and fiefdom, they all come from the same root, which is pecu, which means cattle. And also the word capitalism comes from cattle. Capital means head, caput. Cattle comes from that same root, caput. You count heads of cattle. And capitalism means the principle before interest. Even look at our words for stock, like stockbroker, stock market. This comes from livestock, cattle. It's also interesting to look at the Spanish word for cattle. That's ganado. Ganado means wages or something gained. And ganar literally means to earn wages. Now this gets really fascinating when we look up the word for money in Greek. The Greek word for money is nomisma. The root of nomisma is nomos. Nomos means law, as in the law of Moses or the law of the land. Now the root of nomos is nemo or nemo, which means to parcel out, especially food or grazing to animals. Here we see at its root is agriculture, grazing and agriculture. Also, you can see not only the evolution of money from the idea of cattle in Indo-European languages, such as English, but you can also see it in Semitic languages, such as Hebrew. Like the word for cattle in Hebrew is mikna, and the root word of mikna is kana. Kana means to purchase or to own. Also, the word Hebrew words for jealousy come from kana, jealousy and own and possession. And mikna means both cattle and possessions. Basically, mikna means money and cattle simultaneously. So let's talk about the very beginnings of civilization and why I believe that money and civilization and agriculture, how they're inextricably linked, that they're based on the same principle, and this is the principle of money. It's actually a pretty simple concept. It isn't that complicated. Our words for money, like as in cattle, they also come from agricultural concepts, like we talk about seed money. You invest a seed and you reap the reward. You harvest the seed, the fruit of the seed. This is investment. And this is what civilization is based upon. It's based upon agriculture, planting a seed and waiting for the reward. Whereas wild nature is based upon a pay it forward system. So basically, civilization from its very beginning is based upon owning other living beings, enslaving, 
we call it domestication, but domestication is actually just a euphemism for slavery. They mean the same thing. You own another creature, and you exploit that creature. You use that creature. This is where the word usury comes from. It comes from using, exploiting, exploitation. So basically, you own a creature, you control the creature's food supply, you control the creature's sexual reproduction, and this is for your own profit. You use the creature for not only labor, such as work horses and work oxen, but also as money, as currency. And you can see that the first currency was cattle, as I pointed out in our Indo-European and Semitic roots. So basically, civilization is based upon the concept of agriculture, money, and ownership, and banking. The very first land is the very first bank. This is what agriculture is. It's a bank. It's setting up land as a bank, and you invest your seeds in that bank, and those seeds reproduce, and they bear interest. You put your cattle on land, and the cattle reproduces. The capital reproduces, and beyond the capital is interest. That's your usury, using other living beings. And this is slavery. This is chattel. Our word chattel comes from cattle also. Chattel and capitalism come from the same root, kaput. So basically, you can put your cattle on my land, you can invest your money in my bank, and the cattle reproduce and bear interest. Then you profit and I profit. You keep some of the profits and I keep some of the profits. It seems like a win-win situation. However, the problem with cattle is they're big and bulky, and also they take up resources. This isn't money from nothing, as is usury nowadays. It's money that actually comes from expendable resources of your land. This is why many herding tribes have to keep on the move, because the cattle deplete one bit of land, so they have to move to another. But if you're in a sedentary community and you have cattle, they basically deplete the land and then you have to buy or use other land, put your cattle on it. Also, if you're trading money, if you're trading your cattle as money, it's difficult to keep carrying cattle everywhere. Hence, this is when non-living currency was invented. This is when people started using things like metal ingots or other forms of trade, other currency of trade. And metal ingots evolved into coinage, of course. But the concept of interest, usury, remained. And the concept of banking remained. This time your bank is your house, or a bench. That's what the word bank means, bench. You set up your bench, and people bring your, their ingots, or their coinage, and you hold it for them. And the fee that comes from holding money is called interest. The money, like the cattle, bears interest. It multiplies. But this time, your money currency, because it's a non-living entity, doesn't deplete resources. That sounds great. Now you're making profit from nothing. With cattle, you're making profit with something. You're also aware that your exploitation depletes resources. But with the new money, with ingots and coins, you realize that your money is actually an idea in the head. And an idea in the head can come from nothing. So basically, you are, when you are charging interest, you are creating money out of thin air, and you are profiting from nothing. You are profiting from no resources, no goods and services, no labors, nothing. You're not working for your money. Your money is working for you. This is the saying of an investor. Let your money work for you. Don't work for your money. By the investor's very own admission, the investor doesn't work for money. Money comes from nothing. 
So for the banker, for the investor, this sounds great. You're getting money from nothing. Let's step back and look at the bigger picture. Money from nothing. You're accumulating massive amounts of wealth now. This is what bankers do. From nothing. Not from your own work. But from thin air. So basically, usury, gaining money from nothing, is really the same concept of counterfeiting money. We consider that criminal, yet it's the very same principle as interest, gaining interest. And what happens? You accumulate all of these nothings, which is what money is. It's nothing. It's an idea. It's an idea in the head. You're taking your nothings and trading them for somethings. You're trading them for goods and services produced by other people, produced by the environment. And this is exactly why goods and services flow from the workers to the non-workers. This is why goods and services flow from the poor to the rich. This is why there is massive poverty in the world. This is why there is massive environmental destruction in the world. We believe that we can trade nothings for something. Money creates the illusion that there are unlimited resources because money itself is an unlimited so-called resource, but it is nothing. But the goods and services that we trade for money are limited, limited resources. This is what's insidious about money, is the very idea of money separates the producer from the consumer. So we are unaware of where our goods and services are coming from. The goods that we use are produced, say, overseas in sweatshops, exploited labor. They're produced by environmental destruction, say in the Congo, by Congolese children digging up minerals day in and day out in slave labor so that we can have our computers and our cell phones, etc. So we're unaware of the exploitation that our lifestyles are producing. This is why I'm adamant about figuring out a way to make money go obsolete living without money. I want to talk a little bit more about the etymology of money and the mythology of money. If you, we can even see it in the very beginnings of our mythology. And by mythology, I don't mean non-truth. I define mythology in the same way that Joseph Campbell defined it. It's a story that reveals deep principles within us, and deep principles within our civilization. So I was talking about the Hebrew word for cattle being mikneh. The root of mikneh is kana. Kana means purchase, and kana means possession, and also the Hebrew word for jealousy comes from kana. Lo and behold, we find the concept of Kana in the very first stories of the Bible in Genesis. For example, Cain. There's a play on, there's a play on words in the story of Cain and Abel. When Cain is born, Eve says, I have purchased a man from the Lord. The word for purchase is Kana. It's a play on words with Cain. Cain represents purchase. Cain is the child of purchase. Google Translate translates it for what it says. And the man knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have bought a man for the Lord. So yeah, so then let's look at the story of Adam and Eve and taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This story is actually about the birth of money and interest and agriculture. What we miss out in English is that Hebrew in the Bible is full of puns, and these puns reveal deeper meanings. Let's look at the story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. First of all, in Jewish rabbinical literature, 
it's said that Cain is the offspring of the devil. He's the offspring of the serpent. He's the offspring of purchase. This is what I want to show. In Genesis 3.13, after Adam and Eve had taken the fruit, Eve says, the serpent deceived me. The word for serpent, interestingly, is nahash. And the word for deceived is nasha. Nasha, deceived, also means to charge interest and to lend at interest. Also, it's interesting to look at the word for snake bite in Hebrew. The word for snake bite is nashach. For example, when in later in the Torah, in the story of the Israelites in the wilderness, snakes come along and bite them. That word for bite, snake bite, is nashach. Nashach not only means snake bite, but it also means to lend on usury. It's an entering into of debt. Now remember that in the New Testament, Jesus uses the word debt and sin synonymously. For example, in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts even as we forgive our debtors. In another gospel, it says forgive us our trespasses. So trespassing, sin, and debt are synonymous. And these are core principles in Judaism and Christianity. Snakes are actually symbolic of the creditor, and the snake bite is the lending at interest. Even other words for serpent and dragon, such as Leviathan, represent the same idea. Levi, Levi in Leviathan, also means to bind with debt. And this is the whole idea of the Levitical law, like the book of Leviticus. It's Law represents binding in debt. And this is the idea in Christianity of freeing ourselves from debt. Forgive us our debts, even as we forgive our debtors. Freeing ourselves from the old law of debt, credit and debt. And this is the very first concept of money. This is the knowledge of good and evil. Like the New Testament calls the law, the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the tree of credit and debt. The knowledge of credit and debt. This is confirmed by the very vocabulary, the Hebrew vocabulary of the Genesis stories. So when Eve says, the serpent deceived me, she's also literally saying, the serpent bit me. She's also literally saying, the creditor charged me interest. It can mean any of those things. And in the end, the great curse for Adam and Eve was agriculture. No longer does the earth provide for them as the earth does for all wild creatures. Now they're living in a world of domestication. Now they're living in the world of agriculture. And this is the curse said in Genesis. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. All the days of your life. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. And what is Cain's deal? Cain is the first agricultor. Cain brings produce from the ground, and Cain is the son of purchase. That is the meaning of Cain's name. And this, is, this play on word goes into the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan is the place where money and agriculture are said to have begun in the Levant. From there spreads the commerce of the world. Reclaiming Canaan and returning it to the state of grace is actually the subtle theme of the entire Bible. I talk more about these things in my website, along with the frequently asked questions. I have essays, and one of them is called The Seven-Headed Dragon. And there are other essays also that talk about these concepts. These essays talk about these concepts in the Bible and other world mythologies.